this week on The Travel Show. Heading back for the first time in over two years. There's go to gate. <laughs> this Aussie girl is finally going home. <laughs> Laying on a special treat as a thank you to Thailand's monkeys. <laughs> and how the aftermath of the Second World War helped to create one of Berlin's most famous takeaway snacks. But first, with the Christmas holiday season beginning, many will be crossing their fingers for a return to something more like normality when compared to this time last year, particularly those expats heading home to family. And for Australians who've been abroad during the pandemic, which includes myself, reuniting with family back home this year will be especially significant. There are a few things you have to do to go to Australia. First of all, you need to be eligible to go to Australia. It's not completely open. Uh, you have to be double vaccinated and be able to prove it. Um, and then you get the proof of that. You do an Australia travel declaration, very similar to the arrival documents you have to do for most places across the world now. And you have to do one of these lovely PCR tests. So I'll be dealing with that soon. You're not recording it. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind it at all. This is like an extra little bit of my passport at the moment, as far as I'm concerned. So it went from a situation where you could easily travel around the world at the drop of a hat to you need to have a long-term plan and a lot of money to get into your own home country as an Australian. I think the first reaction was shock, like everyone around the world when the pandemic hit, and also feeling quite grateful when Australia did shut its borders initially because it felt like, well, everything's being done to keep my family and friends safe, and surely this is a sensible precaution but it was this low-lying kind of stress because it meant if something happened to someone at home, uh, instead of being 24 hours away, 36 hours away maximum, now you just couldn't get home. It wasn't possible um, unless you had very deep pockets. I'm originally from the UK, but I've lived in Australia now for a number of years. And I'm married to an Australian, we're all Australian citizens, we've got four kids. We came on holiday initially in early March for a three-week holiday to visit family in the UK. And, and we've been trapped here ever since, stranded. The main challenge is that they've got a small house and there's six of us. So we're filming this, we're actually asleep. This is my dad's study in a shed in the garden. And the uncertainty of not knowing when that would stop has been particularly difficult. When the Australians decided to put limitations on the number of people arriving because of pressures on quarantine, the airlines have actually been forced to discriminate against the economy passengers. And so we've actually been removed from a couple of flights. We've done everything in our financial means to get home, but we're just, we're just not able to. Well, we did actually get back home eventually here in Tasmania. We had a three week holiday to the UK, which be actually became a six month extended stay. We feel so blessed to be home, even here a year on, to be back here in Hobart after such a time. We had instances in Australia where some passenger planes were carrying maybe two, four or five passengers into Australia. That's how bad it got. Surprisingly, it was hugely supported and for a long, long time. There's polling that shows consistently around two, th two thirds or three quarters of the Australian public actually did support these very, very strict international border bans 
even when it meant locking out their compatriots. Thankfully, after a late start, Australia really did a fantastic job in terms of getting vaccinated. It was a bit of a heart, kind of. I won't be working as a barista anytime soon. <laughs> Victoria, my home state, has already reached 90% vaccination, um, which uh, yeah, is quite emotional for me because uh, it's meant I can go home. So. It's going to be a lot of tears over the next few days. <laughs> this is very exciting, very exciting. Although I've, I've completely lost the knack of how to pack. I used to be like, pew, pew, pew. I could be packed in 15 minutes and now I'm like, oh God, what's the weather going to be like? Hot is the answer to that. I have to wait a little while while my test gets checked, but I'm like, I just want to, I just want to go. <laughs> So there's been a bit of a curveball in the last few hours. Concern mounts as countries around the world ban flights from southern Africa. A third case of the new Omicron so variant. The Omicron of variant of coronavirus are confirmed in the UK. So I've just received notification that the quarantine has been reimposed to some extent. So it was quarantine free travel. Now it's 72 hours of quarantine upon arrival and having to be isolated from my family. So the joyous reunion is maybe <laughs> off the cards. I don't really know what's going to happen, um, how I'm going to be isolated within my family home. If that's possible, do I need to get a hotel? I also need to get a permit to enter the state of Victoria, which despite my research, I've just found out about. So. It's getting a bit complicated. Um, I guess the joys of traveling during COVID. Well, there's go to gate. <laughs> oh man, I'm so excited. I don't even care if I have to quarantine, I don't care. Let's see, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, I've just checked in and I've just seen the uh, Melbourne. It's fine. <laughs> Welcome on board. I'm on a flight 10 down to Darwin and I'm going to Melbourne tonight. We're just about to head off. Um, and I'm so excited. <gasps> Jackpot on a long haul flight. Three seats to myself. Yes. To date, the overall death toll in Australia from coronavirus is just above 2,000. So they have done extraordinarily well in protecting life. Technically, the issue of stranded Australians, or stranded Aussies as it became known colloquially, um, that should have abated by now. Although there are still government repatriation flights being put on by the Australian government because there are some places in the world where people didn't get vaccines that will be authorised or recognised by Australia. Um, it makes it very challenging for them to get on commercial flights. I haven't left Russia in two years, coming up to February. I've given up hope on Christmas. I'm thinking I'll be lucky to get back by February next year if things go well for me. I've just been living this like limbo existence where I don't know what next month is going to bring. I've been living with the constant dagger over my head of the Russian government just saying, your visa's up. And I don't know what the hell I can do then. What do I, like, where do I go if that is the situation? Because what country wants me at the current moment with the, um, everyone having COVID, I'm not properly vaccinated. And at a status where, where I have a status where 
I don't know when my own government will let me back into my country. About 15 minutes away from landing now. After a very long flight <laughs> and a quick stop in Darwin. And we hope you've enjoyed your service on board. Today, we do look forward to seeing you on board one of our aircraft units. I'm out, I'm free. I'm out of quarantine at long last and it's given me a bit of a chance to reflect on what it's meant to come home. Oh, oh, I you guys. Yeah. My word, we are lucky to live in a time where in, in usual circumstances, you can jump on a plane and 24 hours later be on the other side of the world. In my case, I can be home. And I think the pandemic has sort of shown me that in past years, I've probably taken that for granted. Oh, it just it feels normal to be able to do that. Um, and it's not necessarily something to be taken for granted. And I think going forward, um, I'll feel fortunate every time I get on that plane. Still to come on the show, we're on the hunt for Berlin's best currywurst. Voila, it's eaten by everyone, from homeless people to the chancellor. And we're in Thailand to see a monkey festival that's been helping bring back tourists to the region. Well, what can I say? It is great to be home. But now we're turning around and heading straight back to Europe where sausages and curry sauce may not seem the most natural flavour combination. But in Berlin, currywurst, as it's known, has become a street food favourite. So we headed to the German capital to find out more about this dish and its surprising origins. In the 50s and the 60s, currywurst was one of the only fast foods that was easily available and everyone grew up with currywurst. Napoli has a pizza or Spanish cities have paella. It's literally part of the culture of the city. Voila. Hello, my name is Lazo. Uh, welcome to Curry 36, the most famous currywurst stall in Berlin. <laughs> It's actually pretty easy. You just get a sausage, you cut it in six to eight pieces. Then you add uh, the tomato sauce on top and top it with some curry powder and spices and that's it. You also need a fork. <laughs> that simple. Grazie mille, buon appetito, ciao. So we have customers from all over Europe, from Asia, from the States, uh, basic from everywhere. Thanks for your patience, sorry for the inconvenience. Enjoy it, have a nice day, you're welcome. Una y la otra es con carne. I'm actually only able to sell a currywurst in a lot of different languages. <laughs> I'm not fluent in Italian or Spanish or whatever. <laughs> okay. Every region claims to have invented the currywurst. The only true story is how it happened in Berlin. After the Second World War, Hertha Heuwer had a small food stall and um, she always saw the GIs eating out, having like steak and ketchup. She kind of wanted to replicate that, but it wasn't 
possible to have a steak. It was really expensive after the war. And so they just tried it with local ingredients. And um, one day she mixed up curry and ketchup by accident. She tried to refine it, added some more spices, put it on a sausage, had some customers trying it. They loved it and that was the birthday of currywurst. There's currywurst with casing. It's uh, a smoked sausage, a bit more salty, um, a bit more on the savory side. And um, the local thing is currywurst without casing. It's um, a boiled sausage that's fried afterwards and um, it's just a bit more softer and tender. Currywurst without casing, it was actually born out of necessity because after the Second World War, Berlin was isolated within Eastern Germany, so we didn't have enough casing to produce sausages. There was actually no way to get um, the casing in, into Berlin. It was just too expensive. One of the things that stands out is the purity of the ingredients. The tomato sauce is actually as important as the sausage. It's um, basically what we are famous for. This is only about 200 liters of it. On a regular day, we go through like a ton of it in our three restaurants. It's 87% tomatoes, some salt, some sugar, some spices, that's it. Some curry sauces have like actually less than 50% tomatoes. That's not the standard we try to achieve. <laughs> curry was is in Berlin eaten by everyone, from homeless people to the chancellor. I think it's pretty important. It transcends social classes. Everyone eats curry was. So, that's a taste of Berlin. Um, I would say it's down to earth and easy going. But uh, have a try yourself. Next up, we're in Thailand, where tourists have gradually been returning after the government launched a quarantine-free travel scheme in November. And it's just in time for the Lopburi Monkey Festival. Once a year, the resident macaques get to dine like kings. On the most elaborate displays of fruits and vegetables lovingly crafted by locals behind the scenes. We prepare the fruits. We have many, many kinds of fruits. Tropical fruits mostly. Banana, papaya, grape, mango, steen, longken, mango, and all kinds of vegetables. And we learn every year what they like most. We just know that they like durian the most. The feast costs over 100,000 baht. That's over 2,000 pounds. And it's mainly sponsored by the Lopburi Inn, a local hotel. The owner started it 33 years ago, offering a fruit buffet to the monkeys as a thank you for bringing in customers. And it's just grown in size, taking on different themes each year. So, the monkey is an important symbol in Buddhist tradition, and as such, they're revered and treated very well. But a word of caution. You'll be bargaining for more than just a selfie. These long-tailed monkeys are very comfortable around people. That was the first time, I was a bit afraid, but it was okay because it was worse for other people than me, so it was okay. <laughs> And here we are, the moment they've all been waiting for. 
Because of COVID-19, there's been a two-year gap since the last festival. And in general, the pandemic has been hard on both locals and these guys. The city is home to thousands of monkeys. And during the lockdown, a lack of tourists and locals out on the streets resulted in frequent monkey battles over scraps of food. But things are looking up. He like high traditional dessert, like this. This make from egg and he likes durian the most. More than 100,000 travellers took advantage of the Thailand Pass in November. It may not seem like a lot, but that's as high as the number of arrivals from January to October combined. I can see that tourists having fun, a lot of Thai tourists this year, and family and little kids. They're having fun, but less people, less tourists because of COVID-19. But I think um, the events bring joy to lots of people. Well, now their bellies are full, locals are free to take the wheelchairs. Two thousand kilos of food were prepared for the weekend festivities, but nothing is going to waste. The leftovers are taken to monkeys living in the mountain temples outside the city. Well, that's all we have time for on this week's programme. But do join us next week when Rajan will be spreading some Christmas cheer and revisiting some of our favourite stories from a year that, well, let's face it, hasn't been the best for travel. I'm going to be honest with you, <laughs> that was a little bit frightening. We're in an all-electric revamp of an iconic British motor. See that? This is wild, guys. Eleven. Eleven lions. <laughs> this is wild. Until next time, from me, Crystal Lowerwood, here in Australia, at home, finally, and the rest of the Travel Show team, it's goodbye, and see you next time. Yeah.